It is a privilege to be here and to deliver the message today. I'm aware that I'm a Methodist theologian uh, preaching in the Methodist house, but meeting with the Presbyterians. <laughs> so this is uh, certainly uh, the ecumenical work uh, that we're all talking about and uh, that does not stop at the borders of Christianity, but really uh, transcends uh, into interfaith ministries as well. Uh, very often I realized uh, these things work best when we're not just talking in general, but when we're dealing with specific issues. Uh, grace under pressure is something very different from the grace on the mountaintops. You know, usually we think grace is something we receive individually, perhaps on a retreat where it's all quiet. Uh, but there is something to be said about grace under pressure because this is uh, in many ways where it's at and this is where I think God is at in so many ways um, and we're missing it if we're not there. Now this is World Communion Sunday and uh, communion, uh, you know, for theologians, uh, we try to think these things systematically, is part of the means of grace. This is an old tradition, the means of grace tradition, uh, that comes to us really uh, from the Roman Catholic roots. Uh, you find it very strongly in the Anglican traditions where the means of grace are, uh, first of all, prayer, reading the Bible, and Holy Communion. So Holy Communion is uh, one of these means of grace. But there is one more thing, and, and this is perhaps uh, an interesting insight of John Wesley's and uh, perhaps one of the contributions of Methodism to Christianity that's not particular to Methodists but perhaps expressed better in Methodism uh, in, in some ways. Unfortunately, the Methodists are not aware of it, so uh, this, is, this, is really <laughs> this is really a struggle that I have been uh, fighting over the years and it's, it's uh, expressed in a little book titled uh, grace under pressure. Um, so what, what am I talking about? John Wesley, as an Anglican priest all of his life, of course, knew these means of grace. But he added another element to the means of grace uh, that uh, oftentimes is not considered in this way. John Wesley talked about works of mercy as means of grace. And Wesley took this so far that he said there are many Methodists that have fallen from grace Keep in mind, that's an option in Methodism. It's not, it's not one saved, always saved. You can fall from grace. You can just, you know, lose it all. Um, falling from grace, though, uh, for Wesley meant, you know, there are people that go to church every Sunday, that read the Bible, that pray, that uh, celebrate Holy Communion regularly, that have still fallen from grace uh, because he felt uh, they have not considered the works of mercy as means of grace. And then uh, the three scripture passages that were read today uh, for Wesley were part of the undergirding of this theology of the works of mercy as means of grace. Now, this all sounds, uh, you know, fairly simple on the top, but once you come to think of it, you know, a lot of things change. Works of mercy as means of grace become two-way streets. Very often we think of works of mercy, even works of advocacy, as something that goes from those of us who are more privileged to those who are less privileged. We're doing someone a service. And, and this is certainly an important aspect of it. It can become patronizing at times, of course, if it's a one-way street. And, and that's true even for advocacy, which is important, uh, as you all know here. So here, as means of grace, um, Wesley is adding something that I think is really at the core of Christianity. You know, Jesus knew this, the prophets really knew it. Uh, Moses, uh, in some ways, embodied it. And this is what it is. If it's a means of grace, then it is automatically a two-way street. Means of grace are, one way uh, to express it, channels of God's grace whereby we receive God's grace in our own lives. That's, of course, clear for the traditional means of grace, right? Uh, reading the Bible. It's not only that we read the Bible, that's the one-way street attitude. Uh, scholars like doing that. But it's also that the Bible reads us. Something comes back in return, and that's the two-way street. So, so it's not 
that easy to open the book because sometimes something comes back and it challenges you and it changes you. Same thing for prayer, by the way. You know, it's not just we're praying up to some God who then listens patiently. Uh, but if you pray, you have to be ready to receive something in return and to be challenged. You know, you pray for peace in the world. Well, maybe what comes back to you is this challenge that you then work for peace in the world, you know, or that God uh, calls you to some specific sort of work that has to do with the sort of thing that you're praying for. Same thing for Holy Communion. It's a two-way street. Now, think about this uh, in terms of the means, uh, the works of mercy for a moment. As you engage in works of mercy, works of advocacy, works of justice with others, it's really not just works of mercy, works of justice might be a better way of talking about it. Something comes back to you. And not just a warm, fuzzy feeling that you went out and you helped someone, uh, but perhaps a real challenge. Uh, I find this in mission trips sometimes, uh, and uh, if it doesn't happen, I think it's a lost cause, the mission trip. Uh, namely, that you go somewhere uh, supporting others and you realize what's really going on. You're realizing uh, what the causes are for the struggle of other people. So uh, it's never just enough, you know, Methodists had this wonderful campaign uh, distributing nets against malaria. Uh, that's great, you know, and, and uh, it certainly helps. But once you're out there, say, in Africa, and you're realizing what the causes are of malaria and that this has something to do with global capitalism that's digging big holes in the ground uh, where water collects and mosquitoes breed, uh, or uh, where it has something to do, uh, you know, with how we structure communities communities or how we destroy communities, uh, how we are part of this deal. Uh, that's what I mean by two-way street. Now, you might think this is all at the social level, only that you learn something there, you know, you're doing social analysis. But if Wesley is right, uh, a means of grace is always where you meet God. So you're going out there, you're doing something, not just uh, as a social cause, but really as a place where you can meet God again. So now we're having something that's really at the heart of the church as a whole. Uh, whatever happens in works of mercy, justice, and advocacy is something that now comes back into the theological heart of the church into the worship of the church because we now start to see God differently. It's now no longer just, you know, we know who God is and we carry that God around, bringing God to others, but now God approaches us precisely from those places where we had least expected it. And you can see why Wesley was so concerned that if this doesn't happen, faith is dead. Christians are no longer Christians. So the sort of ministries that are happening here, it seems to me, uh, whether it's uh, you know the Methodist uh, Church and Society, uh, the Presbyterian um, uh, Witness, uh, and, and uh, many of these other ministries, are not fringe ministries or ministries in addition to many others, but perhaps at the very heart, because this is then what reshapes everything else. And Wesley, uh, sorry to mention this name just one more time, uh, knew, knew that. <laughs> knew that as well. So now uh, you're engaging in these acts, in these actions. You're now coming back, the whole thing changes. You read the Bible differently. I, I've seen this with my students a lot. You take them out of their comfort zone, they come back and they read their Bible differently. They read Augustine differently. They read Calvin, Luther, uh, you name them. All these figures now look differently, much to the dismay of my colleagues, because that disrupts academic business. Uh, but no, I mean, all of a sudden, uh, something happens. Uh, and perhaps you start praying differently. It's no longer just miracle hour on Fifth Street, you know. Uh, now it's, uh, you're praying for really expecting God to make a change in this world. Imagine, rather than just to, to Aunt Millie, you know, and, uh, and her ducks hunt. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is a bit sarcastic here, but unfortunately, when, whenever I visit churches, very often that's what the prayers of the people are. You know, just little uh, me and my friends sort of prayers. Uh, we have given up expecting something bigger from God. But, but that's what, what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Don't, don't play down this other stuff, but think about what it would mean to bring um, 
everything together. Now, today is World Communion. I want to say a special word about Holy Communion as well, because I think this is uh, the event uh, where, where all of it ultimately comes together. If you think about how we structure our services, we have the Bible here, we have our traditions here, we have the people here. And I think this is why it is important to celebrate this communion, not simply, uh, you know, as uh, a group of friends that all know each other and are comfortable with each other, but as people that come from all different walks of life. In Methodism even, we have an open table where we invite not just uh, people who are members of our denomination uh, or even members of any church, uh, but people who repent of their sin and want to live in peace with one another. That is the invitation to the open table. I think theologically this means uh, that this is the place where everything comes together in the presence of God, where the world ultimately celebrates communion. In the old traditions, it was oftentimes remembered also that the dead celebrate communion with us. So, so there is not just us here, but many of the people that have gone before us. And keep in mind, the dead are not just people that passed away of old age, but they're also the martyrs, uh, the people that get killed uh, due uh, to hunger and disease and oppression and war and the sort of things that we have constructed that end up deadly. So here, uh, think of what is happening here truly as an event uh, that symbolizes grace under pressure. This is not a harmless little retreat from the world somewhere, but this is where the world comes together at the table of God, including the dead, including the victims, including those people whom we're not often paying attention to. And this is precisely where God meets us. So if God then through the prophet, uh, through the gospels, proclaims that God wants mercy and not sacrifice, I think this is what we're talking about. How do our traditions look different? How does our Christianity look different? How does our images, how do our images of God look different when we rethink them from the bottom up, from the actual experience of grace under pressure, the sort of things that we experience in engaging in works of mercy, works of advocacy, and works of justice. So in quick compass, really, uh, this is what I think uh, we're doing here and why this is so important, why I have not given up on it. You know, after all these years, sometimes you wonder, are we just playing sandbox games as Christians? Mm -hmm. And I truly believe we're not, and, and perhaps you are embodying this better than uh, many uh, of our fellow Christians, and I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing and to understand that this is what ultimately leads us to the heart of the gospel, to the heart of that which the church and the world is all about. I wish there were more time now uh, to, to expand on this further, but I think uh, you got the basic gist of the messages at the core of our faith traditions. And so I would simply invite you uh, to think more about that, to prayerfully consider how it is uh, that God, that these means of grace change our lives, transform us. And don't think too small. Think big, you know, dream the big dreams. Uh, because if God is truly God of heaven and earth, then that means that the empire isn't. That means that the powers that be are not. And if that's the case, uh, imagine the possibilities. I can only say these words not because I'm strong, because I'm living it all out myself, but because I believe it is the Spirit of God that is at work here. This is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and we give thanks for that. Amen. <laughs>